I hit the button. <laughs> so, hi everybody. Um, so, what we're talking about today, maintaining your site's accessibility well after launch. Um, so, plan is to do some presentation and hopefully have some time for questions or even for you to share your own experiences. Um, feel free to jump in in the middle, but we will have it at the end. Um, so who am I? Why should you care what I say? So I'm Jeanette Stair. I'm a project director for government services at Forum One. Um, my background, I started learning about accessibility in 2009 um, by <laughs> remediating about 100 um, PowerPoint presentations uh, for 508 compliance for, for posting on a conference website at that time. Um, so that kind of experience really gets you to know things. Of course, things have changed since then. Um, so I've also been building up more experience with different technology, websites, PDFs, documents, files, um, different kinds of things, different standards, learning more about WCAG and how as 508 transitioned to be in line with those standards. So that's web content, accessibility guidelines, um, and different clients. So started off with more federal um, clients, but also have been doing more state and local and uh, large and small um, non-government organizations. <clears throat> and so in thinking about my career, I've realized I want to share information. I want everybody to be able to have what I have and what they need. Um, so that aligns with both working on websites in general and also um, being really passionate about accessibility. Um, so for one, this presentation, I didn't write it all alone. Everything I'm sharing is not just from me, it's also from my colleagues at Forum One. Um, so we've been doing a lot of these projects and beyond my experience, I'm also resting on my team's experiences. Um, okay, so this talk has this assumption that you have gone through some kind of rebuild for your website, you built a website, um, during that you thought about accessibility, you programmed those features in so that your website is accessible at launch. But then what? How do you make sure that those things that were accessible at launch continue to be accessible later, continue to be 508 compliant, um, and serve your audiences? So, um, I've seen some common challenges and how they present themselves on websites, so we'll talk through a couple of those. Um, so, people fall into old habits, that's nothing new, that's something we all do, um, especially working under time constraints. If they have done something before, um, they might do it the same way now, despite any kind of training or difference. So. Um, it is important to create new habits um, and as accessibility guidelines change, even if they were doing everything right, um, it might not be enough now. So important to have training, important to talk about how you write for web um, versus print, um, important to how you format things for web and for accessibility for web. Um, and then practice, practice, practice. So people need support, they need practice to form those new habits. Another thing that comes up is the design system's not working. Um, so maybe you, you did this big redesign pro process, project, you picked your new colors or applied your old colors to these new um, features, these components, these patterns. Um, but, and, and you thought at lunch, oh, isn't this so great? It's perfect now. Um, it's not static though. It, it's, there are things that you might not have thought of or might not have been a part of that. And ways you can tell if this is happening is Maybe editors aren't using headings like they're supposed to. They're not going H2, H3, H4. They're skipping around or, oh, I'm not gonna use H5. It doesn't look like anything. Bold actually looks better than H5. I'm just gonna bold. Um, so that's one of those like anti-patterns that if you see that happening, maybe there needs to be a design change. Um, another thing, 
editors use images of text because there's no component to have live text with images. So one of those big requirements is avoid images of text. That's how it's written. So you really want to make sure that your website is giving people a way to do that. Um, and I think a lot of people, again, with the habits, go back to those habits of, oh, we've always had this header on the website, and we put the text of it in there. Is there a better way to do that? Can we expand that design system to include something so that we don't have to have this PNG that has this text in it and then add alt text to it? Um, another thing that I've heard a lot is, how do I highlight this? Um, so you might have too few in your design system or too many ways to highlight information. Um, and that might also be a, a learning training thing. Because if somebody wants to highlight five things on a web page, then they're not highlighting anything, right? If you're highlighting everything, you're highlighting nothing. So, um, so a couple things you can do. Uh, review and update your design system. Don't assume that it is perfect the way it is from the beginning. Um, make sure it's working. Make sure it's keep working. If you haven't had a chance to do usability testing before launch, do it after. Be ready to change it. Um, educate and engage your stakeholders. Um, make sure you have design documentation. Again, if you didn't have a chance before launch, you were really busy, do it after launch. Make sure there are examples for those tools in that toolkit for content editors um, and how those are meant to be used. Because another thing I've seen people do is, oh, we have a component that looks like this. I'm going to use it for this other thing because it looks the way I want it to. But that wasn't the intention of how that you know, call to action box should be used. Um, so, and then it, it kind of makes it not work so well for everybody if it's used that way. Sometimes it's helpful to include the why um, in the documentation or the training so that people can have something to hook their minds onto for, um, for why it is that way. Sometimes that helps people, sometimes it doesn't matter, um, but it can be helpful. We use this component in this way because we found through research that it works best in these situations for these types of users, for our audiences. Clearance. So we're at Drupal GovCon. Um, government clearance is a thing. Sometimes it is more or less difficult. Uh, it takes more or less time and has more or less people involved. Um, so whenever we're talking about public information though, it's an important thing. So I have heard this type of thing before. Oh, we can't change that. It's already gone through clearance. We can't go back through clearance. We need to get this up on time. Um, so it's really important uh, that clearance, <laughs> and this, this might sound like I'm saying it's easy, I know that this is difficult, but clearance does have to, that process has to um, acknowledge accessibility. Accessibility is a legal requirement. Plain language is a legal requirement. So, um, so sometimes some of these format things are okay to change after clearance and it's okay to fix things up for a web, but for example, underlined text. Uh, you can't have underlined text on websites, that's not a link. Um, so things like that, you want to make sure that everybody involved is clear on what the requirements are, what will have to be a certain way for a web. Um, but um, if that's a problem, it is something that needs to be addressed. Um, all right. So that, that, those were a couple challenges. Next we'll go into um, accessibility governance planning. This could be a whole talk on its own. So we're just going to go really high level for now. Um, okay. So basic governance things as a reminder, decide who will own 
accessibility governance, what person or group um, is going to own it um, and follow up on it. Uh, plan your monitoring and auditing strategy. So again, like you might have done your testing when you did your launch, you did your approvals, but that content is being updated. Content is a critical component of the accessibility. You're also making website updates. There might be a feature you didn't get to before that you're adding. There's a bug that needs to be fixed. How are you going to make sure that all that content that gets changed and added or those features or code changes are still maintaining that level of accessibility for your website? Um, so you need a review and update process. Um, annually works a lot of times for this. Um, standards will change. Um, and, and this is for the review and update process. It's also about your governance plan, right? So you need to review your governance plan and update it, usually about annually. Make sure that it's still in line with whatever standards there are out there. And whatever your team construction is, is that person? who owned accessibility governance, are they still there? Um, do we need to find someone else to replace them? Did the groups shift or there was a reorganization? What needs to change about this process? Or, or even just what's not working and can be better? Um, and then also establishing training and knowledge sharing practices. So uh, around your accessibility governance, that needs to be a piece of it. Um, you also have to have some standard operating procedures um, for things like I mentioned, testing updates to the website. When those you know, tickets go through for developers to make updates, um, how are they being tested for accessibility? Is that part of the acceptance criteria? Is there a scan before something gets deployed to the production environment? Um, how is that happening? There are a lot of ways, different ways to do it. Maybe you do it each ticket or each deployment. Maybe you do it once a month. Um, so there are options there to work for your organization, but you want to know what it is. Um, and then um, because you might have internal folks, you might have different vendors, you might be using different kind of platforms, you're using Drupal probably, um, you might have contributed modules. So who's responsible for changes in code, for changes in content, for changes in design, and for third party tools? Um, so a lot of times it's, oh, it's YouTube that did that. Um, so maybe, maybe that's acceptable. Maybe you have an exception that this is how YouTube does it. It's not perfect, but it's not something that we can feasibly fix. Um, or maybe you have some other kind of situation. And then how are you going to verify that something that was fixed was fixed? Uh, so you've identified a bug, an accessibility bug. Um, somebody goes, OK, I fixed it. Is that it? Um, is somebody going to double check that? Um, how, how are you going to do that? Or do you need to document that? Do you want to have those records to show that you have at least tried to do some things, even if there are some, some errors on the site? So, um, Moving on uh, to monitoring and audit strategies. So um, there's, you can combine monitoring and auditing, or you can have them separately. Um, for very small sites, you might be able to get away with manual reviews for continuous monitoring, but that's usually not going to be feasible at a large scale. For larger sites, some things that are common are tools like Site Improve, DeQ, or Level Access. They all have tools for scanning the site, running some automated tests, but none of them are totally automated. Like everything else, um, it takes human interaction. And you'll need to figure out if you are going to like spend the money um, to use one of those tools. They can be really helpful 
but you have to have that structure in place who's going in and looking at what the tools say, who's going in and doing manual verification where needed, um, and who's coordinating for any of those errors to be fixed. Um, so some of the tools are very specific about accessibility, and some have other features. So again, I, I'm not promoting any specific tool, but Site Improve is something that I know a few organizations use because it has accessibility checks, but it also has other kinds of checks that can help with, um, with your website's quality. Um, and then there's audits. So continuous monitoring being continuous and auditing being more on a um, schedule. Um, this is another way that you can make sure that your website is maintaining um, an okay level of accessibility or striving for a really good, um, fully accessible um, website. So there are a couple different aspects to audits that you have options for. Um, so the method, uh, you could, if you have continuous monitoring tools, it can be integrated with that. Um, maybe continuous monitoring is all you need. Maybe you also want to go every year and see how we're doing um, and compare to previous years. So you can use those same tools. You can also do manual reviews. Um, so you can have someone, either someone who's knowledgeable at your organization or you can get another organization to do an audit. They'll go through their, your website and they'll review it and give you recommendations and a report back. Um, something that's really important that I encourage everyone to do if you have <laughs> any way to do it is to do usability testing with actual users of assistive technology. So there are organizations out there, um, a few, uh, who do this. Um, they, they have a group or they have access to people who uh, like really use a screen reader for their everyday use um, and have them go through your website and use it. Can they complete the tasks? And this is always going to be better than me going through your website and I can check against standards, I can use a screen reader and see what I think, but I'm not the person who uses it every day. So it might be good to have like someone like me or someone on your team go through and do those automated checks, those kind of standards checks, but then follow up with this. Um, always real users are gonna give you the real feedback that's most valuable. Um, it's not feasible, typically, to scan every page on your website. Um, so some of the continuous monitoring tools will crawl your website and scan them, but for an audit, um, you would want to, like any kind of audit, take a sample of pages and really look at them closely. So you want to make sure that sample covers all your different page templates or content types that you have. It has um, all your components, the different components you have, so that you are checking kind of every different um, like component or template that you have on the site. I called out tables and forms in particular because they're typically more complicated um, and require specific things to be accessible that are, are often missed. Um, so you'll decide your frequency of your audit, um, making sure you have time to fix whatever you found in the last audit. If you're doing an audit every month and it's the same report every month, you're not getting your money's worth for it. So, um, so uh, if if you have less resources, annually is maybe a good idea, maybe quarterly, but making sure that you do have the resources and the time to fix some things, maybe not everything, but making progress so that that next audit is confirming that you, you made that progress. Um, and the investment, so you're paying for your audit maybe, at least in, in staff time, um, but again, 
it's not helpful unless you can address those things that you've found. Um, so you need to make sure that your plan includes the audit, the fixing things, and then hopefully also the, the verification, the did it really get fixed. Um, great. Okay, so I have to admit, I have not used this myself, but it's very exciting. And some of my colleagues at Forum One have used this on a couple projects um, and, and have um, tweaked it between them. But they have a method for prioritizing accessibility bugs. So, um, so Dan Moyard, who had a, a talk earlier today, um, he was part of the team, and Adam Hudson um, worked on these a lot. So I'll talk through this. If you hate math, you might not like this section. So <laughs> I'll, I'll warn you right now. Um, <clears throat> but um, this is one method. You can kind of think through what might work for you. But basically the goal here is if you have 20 accessibility bugs and you don't know where to start, how do I prioritize these? What do I do first? This is on every page, but this is really bad. Like, which should be the priority? This is a structure to assign numbers to them that you can compare them with, and then think through other considerations. So we're gonna assign an overall rating based on severity, reach, and secondary benefits. We'll add those up, get that overall rating, prioritize based on both that rating and some other considerations I'll talk through. So, <clears throat> severity. So that's like, how bad is this bug? So we have a rating of seven for impossible or things that don't conform with a WCAG A level requirement. So, um, so an image that is an important image that has zero alt text, that's gonna be impossible for someone who's using a screen reader or assistive technology to get the content of um, difficult. Um, so it would be four and would be at that WCAG level AA and awkward would be a one. Um, usually we're not striving for WCAG AAA so maybe, maybe we'd like to get to that level um, but it's less of a priority. And then best practices. So for best practices I always think of Going back to those heading levels, technically it's okay to skip from H2 to H4, but it's really not best practice, so please don't do it. <laughs> um, but it, if it comes up, um, it, it would be that severity of zero. Um, so we're gonna get a number for severity for our bug. Then we're gonna think about reach. Is it on every page? Is it on not every page, but really high traffic pages? Or is it on low traffic pages or just like one page that, that's low traffic? So then we have a rate of either four, two, or zero. Um, and then secondary benefits. All other groups, some other groups, no other groups. Two, one, zero. Um, so for example, keyboard navigation, I always think of as all other groups. I use my keyboard for navigation all the time. A lot of people do. If something is not right with your keyboard navigation, if you can't see that focus indicator, if you get trapped in your keyboard, that's gonna affect everybody. Um, so that's where that secondary benefits come through. So for example, you might come up with something that looks like this. So your bug is main menu is not keyboard accessible. That's a severity of seven, it's impossible. A reach of four, it's on every page. And secondary benefits two, it's everybody. So you get this overall rating of 13. Um, and then heading skipped, I'll skip down to the last one on this. Um, severity zero, it's a best practice, but it's not a, a compliance issue. Uh, the reach is two, because maybe in this case it's on most pages. Um, and secondary benefits, it could be helpful for some other groups to make sure those headings line up, but it's maybe not everybody. So 
uh, your overall rating. Obviously, my math is a little hard uh, <laughs> because I say two bytes three. But so that lets you, you can do this for each of your bugs. And then you have a rating. You have a nice comforting number, if that's how you feel about numbers, where you can compare them. You can sort by that column and start to make decisions. But there are some other considerations. So you want to think about you know, best bang for your buck as well. Um, so you do want to prioritize based on development workflow. This is something the technical folks will need to advise on. Um, but an example of this is front-end developers, if there's a global style, they'll want to do that before doing a more specific style that's, that's in a certain location. Um, so there might be things that developmentally need to happen before something else. So you'll want to factor that in. Um, you can also take that overall rating that you got, that 13 or that 3, um, and you can divide it by a time estimate. So you have somebody go through, okay, this is going to take an hour, this is going to take eight hours, this will take 15 minutes. So then you can see um, how much gain you'll have, again, in a numeric way, if that's helpful for you, um, where you can um, prioritize based on that. So that's a method that, that my colleagues have used. I definitely want to try it out. Um, I think it's really helpful. Um, but presenting that to you all um, to think about. Um, and then there's some, going back to kind of the broad topic of this talk, accessibility, long-term considerations, some things to think about beyond what we've already talked about. Um, it's not over. It's never over. Accessibility guidelines change. Technology changes, both what we use and, and assistive technology. Um, so what is enough now will not be enough later. That's what we found before, right? Before 508 changed to be in line with it with CAT. Um, those requirements change. What used to be an accessible website would not today be considered. So um, your work and your work context change too. So capacity and processes need to change as well. So, so some thoughts um, for, you know, uh, you've launched your website and then what happens? Um, and that's all I had in the presentation part. So I do want to open it up. You all have experience. Share your experience. Ask some questions. Happy to talk through things. Thanks. question or a vent or like a, mm -hmm. a venting is fine thing. too but so um, we work with government agencies and build the site build out their initial content everything's great and then um, you know continue to host it and work with them and then it's a lot of user generated content and we work with departments of education so that they also will have teachers uploading content mm -hmm. and we're like just several steps removed from you know, by the accessibility team, and, and then it's the, and even, you know, obviously with Drupal, it's like, they're going to have an alt text, but their alt text is a turd, and it's like, yeah. not good, yeah. or, yeah, there's, you know, images with text, and there's all these mm -hmm. things where eventually the site, the technical mm -hmm. tool is accessible, but, like, the content gets out of hand, yeah. and I, I'm like, technically, that's not my responsibility. But what are you going to tell a teacher who's like uploading, you know, lesson guides to help other teachers like go back and read your stuff? Mm. So I don't know if you or anybody has any thoughts on that. I know definitely looking at more tools within Drupal in the content creation experience to like mm. flag it as they're uploading it or check it and say heads up, that's not mm. going to fly. Um, but yeah, when the users creating the content are not at all, you know, first in. Yeah in this stuff. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a challenge, the, the user-generated content. Um, and I don't know that I have any solutions, so maybe, maybe it is more event, but, um, but Kelly? So a quick question for you. Are, are people that are uploading the content, are they in a content manager role? 
or were they just uploading? Yeah, they would have. They yeah, they would have a content manager role, okay. limited, but yes. So, okay. one of the things that we have for our content managers at HHS is we utilize site Yeah. And there is a Drupal module that um, links with site So actually, the content editor manager actually get <coughs> a report as the get ready to publish. And they can look at, you know, check broken links. They can look at accessibility scores, SEO, plain language, um, quite a number of areas to look at within that page. So, you know, if, if you have site improve as an option, mm -hmm. you know, that might be something that they can look at to see. Um, and then just a little bit of education mm -hmm. back in their lab, you know, because teachers like to learn. Yeah and provide them with a new experience on how to improve their content. Mm -hmm. yeah. More about this topic? Yeah. yeah, go for it. Yeah, so also the other thing is like getting their buy-in. Like I think it's really important mm -hmm. to see part of the training, just educating them on the benefits because they will feel more compelled to provide that service mm -hmm. if they understand who the user might be and who that could impact because it could be any number of people that they know that would otherwise not be able to use the service. Right, right. And I feel like it, with this particular group, it's like they would very much care mm -hmm. if they knew mm -hmm. that it was a it's thing. The education. <laughs> it's right. exactly. the education process. We yeah. do the same thing with Crest Team on Underlines mm -hmm. because they're yeah. notorious for underlining content. Yeah. And right. that, was, that was big. Yeah. <laughs> And if it's really uh, like community generated content, so mm. this is a community of teachers, they probably have other guidelines that say we don't say this when we use these, you know, this kind of language. <coughs> it's inclusive, that it, you know, mm -hmm. it does these kinds of things, it's grade appropriate or whatever happens to fit with that community, and you could add in something about accessibility. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, especially if the resources are gonna be used like with students. And those students might need that, you know, PDF to be um, accessible so that all the students can be able to use it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it sounds like I'm, I'm hearing about the need for educating the educators in that um, and maybe having some resources. Or I, I think it sounded like you were saying um, trying to get kind of a reminder or, or some kind of an indication when they're adding content, like, hey, did you make sure X, Y, Z? Um, that sounds like a great idea, but also having some way to, to share some of that information with them. There's actually a module you can use to generate recommended titles based on computer vision for images. For images. And that, um, I think it's called um, automatic alternative text or something like that. It uses, um, it recommends the title in line when so I, I would caution, um, I know a lot of that is happening, but I, I think especially in this space, like, um, as long as there's a step for a human to, to review, yeah, yeah, yeah. making sure yeah. that that's there. Sure. Yeah. I think the common denominator, and this is, this, regardless of what area you're working in with your website, is the education of accessibility. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if I did it in the military, you know, the first thing that was always left out was training. Mm -hmm. Same thing with web. The first thing that's left out is accessibility. Mm -hmm. But because we have the laws on our side, it's an education process. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so we use Site Improve uh, mm -hmm. as helpful uh, at the New Jersey Judiciary. Um, but it's more text-based, so I'm wondering if anybody has any recommendations for any visual um, tools, like design-based tools, or maybe even things that will examine, like keyboard. Um, so Site Improve does talk about yeah. the keyboard accessibility. Um, okay. Uh, uh, it, it'll check color contrast, yeah, it'll talk too. Color contrast. Um, it, it'll give you, so the one thing with Site Improve is that you can actually adjust it for accessibility. So if you just want to look at your, your single A ratings, or your double A, 508, or triple A, 
you can adjust that, and it's yes. going to yes. give you all the recommendations there for a page. So if it's saying, you know, things aren't in the proper category, it's going to give you those recommendations. Um, if it detects those, yes. Um, but but there are some things that can only be yeah. reviewed yeah. by you humans. Use, you know, automated tools are only going to um, cover 60 to 70 yeah. percent of the test. The rest of it is all manual. Go ahead. I wonder if possibly to answer your question, are we talking about like a browser based evaluation tool? Like something where you can get a visual you know, mm, report? So mm -hmm. are our organization is starting to use um, apps? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and that's from DeQ. Um, that's the company. So D E Q U E. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so Axe has a free browser plugin and a paid version. Um, so they have a couple different things. There are also some plugins, like uh, browser plugins that I use. Um, uh, Site Improve has a free browser pl plugin uh, that can be helpful. Have they? Oh, I'll, I still use it. Maybe they're not updating it though, so I'll have to look into that. There's also Accessibility Insights for Web has a re is a really good free option because it'll do a quick scan. They even have a medium scan I haven't, uh, they just came out with, I haven't done much, but they have a full scan where it walks you through those manual tests that need to be done. So if you're looking at a page um, or doing one of these audits, it'll help walk you through, okay, on your page, it'll highlight certain sections of your page and then say, like, ask you questions, is this right? Is this, you know, alt text right for this image? Or um, can you do X, Y, Z? Is it um, showing up right? So that can be really helpful. Ellen? I just want to say with uh, side improve, I'd like to say that uh, there are so many bells and vessels that I didn't know that existed mm -hmm. because they were hidden. So what I did was just contacting the person that was in charge of access to accessibility for organization and that they had set up this training for us so that it showed all the features. So they do have a training on side improvement. Yeah. So if you yeah, back them. The, pro the problem with, with us is, you know, like we just count all of the text recommendations because a lot of them are like misspellings, but mm. it's a judge's opinion. We well, can't change that. True. Uh, <laughs> and you know, they're they're you know we have a, a similar that we have a, a Staff did within the HHS department deals with um, where it's all legal decisions. So yeah. we have to maintain all those decisions as the written decision. Right. So you know but they all get flat. Yeah, they all do. So you know we can we can talk after and I can mm -hmm. show you how we address those or how we're getting ready to address those because we're setting up accounts for those personnel in that department to receive reports. Um, to maintain their quality yeah. and address them. But yeah. they're, they're definitely critical right. aspects. Because again, plain language, they're obviously, you know, 22nd grade yeah. level. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily um, need to stand right Yes. It just, uh, I just would say, the other family of checker that's out there, um, University of Toronto and Princeton University have been funding Sally and Victoria and their content will so they're designed to be integrated with your CMS. Mm -hmm. They just pop up alerts like as soon as someone saves a page, and they're designed to be completely not tech. They don't repeat with site improvement of bot. These are just for your teachers to mm -hmm. sort of say, hey, maybe that's a really terrible alt text. Um, so, um, and so what was the name of that again? Sorry, so, I, 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 I'm like so gauche, but like <laughs> um, so like the editorial and Sally library is like what we're developing is mm -hmm. help. Okay. It's just kind of trying to like the spell check side of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's not spell check. It's like yeah. accessibility spell check. Mm -hmm. so it's like bad link titles, bad mm -hmm. alt text, mm -hmm. missing headings. So just the really basic things yeah. for the content folks, but not to compete with people. Yeah. But does that integrate with CK Editor? Not yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Give me another year. Is this <laughs> <laughs> uh, It's 
I, yeah, I don't know what it is, too. So, editorially? Editorially. Yeah. yeah. And then Sally is the other one. Other questions, comments, complaints? <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank